Carnegie Mellon University's advanced database systems course is filmed in front of a live studio audience. Again, just get through this, get out early, and go see the clubs. So, uh, for this point in the, in the, in the semester, we're going to start, uh, start reading papers about individual systems. Uh, so obviously the paper you guys read today was on, was on Google BigQuery, but the purpose of this part of this, the semester is now to uh, examine and look at how you know, companies were building real systems based on the technologies and methods and techniques and algorithms that we talked about throughout the entire semester. Um, and the goal of this is to, one, learn how we can read the papers from, from you know, in, in industry. Some of it's a little bit marketing heavy, some of it will be actual true systems discussions. But I basically understand how like, they've applied the things that we've talked about to solve the real world problems. And also for you to then be able to interpret it and, and uh, recalibrate maybe what they, how they describe certain things based on the fundamentals of what we talked about. So for example, sometimes you'll see systems talk about you know, technique ABC in, in, in slightly different language that we talked about, but then you know because we've read certain papers, oh, it's re it's really describing this. Um, we, not to pick on Dremio, but we'll, we'll see Dremio in a second. Uh, they talk about having these things called reflections. Like, what the hell's a reflection? I've never heard of that before. And you go kind of read the documentation a bit more. Oh, it's just materialized views. Right, so it's, it's, the idea is like, again, now you have the, this, this core background knowledge about how these real-world systems are actually built, and then you can cut through the BS and understand what's going on. You say reflections? They call it reflections. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Okay. And then, and then also, too, now you also have this, this internal catalog you be able to build to say, okay, well, in, in the good papers, at least especially in the Databricks one, they'll talk about, oh, we had this problem, so we solved it this way. We had this problem, solved it that way. So again, when you go out in the real world, uh, you'll be able to see how, you know, apply those, those same the lessons you've learned from reading these papers and other systems to different situations. And of course, it's always nice to understand that, like, I didn't just make this stuff up. Everything we talked about this semester is, is real. So, uh, as I said, we're going to talk, start off with uh, Google Dremel, a BigQuery today. Uh, Wednesday, we'll talk about the Databricks, Spark, SQL, and Photon, and then Snowflake, DuckDB, Yellowbrick, and, and Redshift. So, again, because of the, whatever, the stomach virus, we had to drop the last one, and I decided to drop the, the Microsoft paper um, instead of the yellow brick one because, as he, he was asking about before, the yellow brick one is wild because they do all sorts of low-level system optimizations, and they report real numbers in their papers, uh, whereas these other papers, you're not going to see that. Um, partly because these big companies don't want any numbers they report in these papers then be used against them in like a judo marketing move by their, their competitors. But yellow bricks, they, they don't give a f They put all the numbers in. It's awesome. OK. So the reoccurring themes we're going to have uh, throughout the entire uh, the papers we're going to read are, again, all the things that we've talked about this, this semester. So obviously, the resource disaggregation, se separating compute and storage. Right? This is the lake house data lake model where a bunch of data is on S3, whatever your object store is, and then we're, we're putting query engines on top of that. We're also going to see the challenge of dealing with the lack of statistics. Right? The BigQuery paper certainly talked about this. We'll see this over and over again, where it's a bunch of files that were uploaded into the object store outside of the, the control of the database system. So now you get the query shows up, you want to start planning on it. Well, if you're, if you're a cost-based optimizer, what are your costs going to be based on if you don't have any statistics? Obviously, everything is going to be columnar, but we also want to handle the non-relational data, like the JSON. In the case of the BigQuery, it was, it's the protobuf files. And then vectorized execution, as we talked about before. Again, these are our, like this thing is pretty much standard in every OLAP system today. So none of the papers are really going to talk about any unique, unique aspects of what they're doing. Just it, it'll always be there. All right, so let's talk about now the setup for, for Google's uh, Dremel BigQuery paper. So maybe not in, you know, for, for, the, for the people that are younger here, maybe not now uh, you don't think of like Google as the hot like tech company, like maybe like OpenAI is you know is, is what everyone's excited about these days, something like that. Um, but in the two in the two thousands, Google definitely had a sizable um, uh, influence on how people thought about and designed and developed database systems. And even to this day, I would say the their their pushes maybe or influence in maybe is not as strong as it used to be, um, simply because the the technologies have, per, have been spread out and proliferated. Uh, much farther now. Obviously, LLMs are the, are the hot thing. But back then, you know, pretty much any time Google put out a paper, 
a research paper that said, hey, here's this system we built internally at Google. Uh, that everyone read it, everyone got really excited, and then people started building open source clones of these things. Because um, the mindset in some ways was, well, Google's super successful. Google can, can operate at scale. Uh, if, we need to, you know, if, if our company wants to be successful, then we need basically the same stuff that they're building. Because Google uh, didn't release their things as open source, they didn't, didn't, at least in the beginning, didn't release their things as, as services. Right? They're just like, hey, here's this paper written by Jeff Dean and others who are obviously very smart people, but everyone's like, okay, just they scramble then to re-implement everything. So this is sort of an incomplete list of a bunch of the, the database systems or data systems that Google has developed over the years that have been very influential. And I've sort of subdivided it into to, to two groups. At the top here, you have all the, the NoSQL systems, right? Because again, Google was, was the, you know, the, without maybe coming out and saying, yes, we're a NoSQL company, but they certainly were at, at the, the forefront of the vanguard of the, the NoSQL data movement, right? And you saw this in the paper you guys read. And then there's all these other uh, these systems in the late early 2000s, uh, you know, in, in sorry, late late 2010, early late 2000s, early 2010s, and going forward, where Google realized oh, SQL is actually a good idea, and then started adding, you know, started building systems around this. Um, again, in the paper you guys read, there's this this paragraph right here that talks about how the conventional wisdom Google was. SQL didn't scale, right? And then again, everyone else sort of followed along this bandwagon and was designing systems based on uh, some of these early ideas. Mongo is probably the, the, you know, the, the, one of the biggest ones, right? Where people were again saying, we don't want to use SQL, SQL doesn't scale, we don't, we don't want to do joins. Uh, and, and then now the, so the tide has turned. And so the Dremel guys talk about how they see themselves as the, the ones that actually made Google, or sorry, made SQL cool again, or important again, or matter again. Uh, in, in Google. So a lot of these, these systems have a sizable influence in a bunch of different uh, uh, other uh, database systems, other data systems. And as I said, a lot of these things started off as early research papers that, that Google put out. And typically the way uh, industry uh, or companies put out papers is it's usually about two or three, maybe even four or five years behind what actually the state of the art is. So like they'll build the system you know, get it up and running, file the patents for it, and then they'll write the paper. By the time the, pa you know, the paper comes out, again, it's, it's a couple years old. Um, but MapReduce, obviously, was, was, was very influential, uh, you know, made Hadoop, made Spark. Bigtable was cloned as HBase, Cumulative Hypertable, and so forth. LevelDB was, was, this is the only one they actually did open source, but then got forked off as RocksDB, and RocksDB is what's more common now. Um, and then there's other example, examples down here. And there's, there's a few other, like Priscilla's from YouTube. Again, there's just the paper, that's not open source. There's, there's, a, there's a couple other systems I could list here that I sort of forgot, or just haven't had, didn't have room. Yes? Why is that we just look at Dremel and not the other one? I feel like you were about to answer that. So why, why, why are we looking at this one, not, not these the other? Not the other SQL one. Right? The question is, why do we, why we, why we care about Dremel in this class right. and not these other ones? Because Dremel is the only one that's doing analytics on the OLAP stuff. Uh. Megastore was a early shredder version of my SQL do transactions. The test is sharded my SQL out of YouTube. Spanner, I would just know about transactions. These are all transactional ones. Napa is sort of getting into the realm of like doing analytics, but it does. Well, we can talk a little bit maybe next class well, you know, in the context of like Delta Lake or Iceberg. But Napa is all about like I'm doing Dremel style analytics on historical data, but I'm also incorporating newly ingested data. And I can make a trade off between how much do I'm going to read from the we only pay the cost of read like the road road data I just I just, uh, just inserted versus like the historical data and then Delta Lake Iceberg they're all doing something something similar yeah but again we, the part of the reason I, again original question why before it's in Dremel it's a, I mean this is a very influential paper this is pretty much how every you know lake house uh, engines can be built today yes what do you mean only for marketing uh, so I have an asterisk for CockroachDB and TidyB only for marketing because when these systems first came out. The Cockroach DB guys certainly worked at Google, but they didn't work on Spanner. And then TidyB guys had nothing to do with, uh, you know, with, with, with Spanner. Spanner was like the hot thing for like, you know, transaction databases. So these guys were, maybe they explicitly didn't say it, but others are saying it and they didn't correct them, that these are open source var variants of Spanner, right? But in the case of Cockroach DB and, and TidyB, that's not the case because Spanner relies on this true time service with like, GPS clocks and, and atomic clocks, like, you know, part of the true time hardware service. 
Cloud Foundry should be doing everything in the software. So again, certainly now they're not going to like say that they're the open source version of Spanner. But if you use Google open source Spanner, you you probably get Cloud Foundry to be a tidy B. Yes. Here's Yes. But I also know that data brings like branding itself as the ones who invented the So I'm wondering who you think is more influential. So his question is like I'm saying that all, all these lake systems are based on the you know the high level architecture of Dremel, but then the Databricks guys, they're the one that branded the lake house term. Yeah. Right? But that's just marketing again. Right? The Trino guys say, no, no, it's not a lake house, you want an ice house. Like that, <laughs> right? So it's just marketing, but the idea of a disaggregated storage, a vectorized execution engine that can read data that, is, that it's never seen before, all that is, is, comes from, from Dremel. There's other aspects, though, I think, like, you know, in case of Snowflake, like Snowflake was doing the vector execution, or actually, more significantly, like Vectorwise. Vectorwise was doing the paper you guys read with, like, all that vector execution stuff. Like, that's prevalent in everything, and that's, that's common now in a lake house system. But they weren't calling it a lake house back in the day. It's just a marketing term. Yes? Did they write the paper before releasing Dremel? Because uh, the paper said, like, uh, sorry, the original was like 2010. Yeah. Like, the VLDB. I, so the original paper is like 2011, right? Oh. I think in the paper they say it came out, it was like a side project in 2006 or something? The original paper was 2010. 21st century. Yeah, I, I think I'm putting the date here based on. They, the, yeah, so maybe the dates are slightly off. This is like the, like this is when it was first known. The pa so the so the paper you guys read is the ten year retrospective of the original paper. The original paper is twenty eleven, but I think that paper mentions that somebody was building it in two thousand six as originally a, a shared nothing system. Right. Uh, it's just like the, the test of time award given the VLDB twenty ten paper. Yeah. So whatever. I'm off by a year. But again, even the paper even says that they started earlier. Yeah. yeah okay. Whatever. The, I, again, I, Napa, I know they, these guys are building this since 2017, 18, but I was under NDA and I couldn't say that, but like, the paper came out in 2021. This is the lake house, right? Napa, right? Napa? Yeah. No. It's, no. it's in, is HNAP then? Because you're saying it's analytics and it does that. It does, like, you ingest, <laughs> you won't get the details of it. You ingest data uh, and it gets appended into the system. I don't know whether that ingestion process is transactional or not. And then they have this notion of like, do I care about uh, when I run, run queries, I specify, do I want to run fast as possible and then maybe, and then, but give up like reading the freshest data? Or do I give up, do I want to read the freshest data and, and pay a little more extra money to get, get faster? Like they have like a, like a sort of, you have like a the objective function like in terms of triangle, not just cost and performance, but also like freshness. Oh, okay. Yeah. Again, we want to, for this class, let's focus on Dremel. They gave a talk um, a year or two ago during the pandemic with us about Napa. It's a, it's a good talk. All right. All right, there you go. I already said 2006, right? So again, this was a side project at Google, like 20% time, like one day a week, they were, they were allowed to work on this. Um, and the idea, the, the original problem they were trying to solve was uh, there's all these artifacts being generated from different tools and services all throughout Google that are just showing up on on GFS, an, an internal file system. And the idea was they want to be able to run queries on top of this data through SQL rather than writing the C++ map reduce jobs. Again, just going back to like the, the, the mid-2000s, and Google saying that they, they don't want to use SQL, everyone's writing these, these map reduce jobs. Hadoop, the open source version of map reduce, was in when Java, the, the Google version was all in C++. So you have to write now C++ code to, to do scans and joins and, and on data. It's terrible, right? Oh uh, yeah, so, so the idea was they wanted to be able to just have a bunch of files sit around on, on disk, uh, sorry, in, in shared storage, and, um, and ingest it. Although the first version actually was, was a shared nothing system, meaning like you had to ingest the data into the system, and then it got internal, you know, it got cataloged, and then the 2010 rewrite was, uh, it should be late 2000, not 2010s. Uh, they rewrote it to now be the disaggregated storage where you're just reading data directly off of uh, Google Files as or GFS, right? And then this was the paper, the first paper came out in I think 2010, and then the, it was got commercialized in, 
in, as BigQuery in 2012. And the reason why I had you guys read the, the, the follow-up paper rather than the original paper is because the original paper doesn't talk about the shuffle service, uh, which this one does. And that, that's actually a key thing that separates uh, BigQuery from other systems and allows them to do some interesting optimizations that other systems can't, can't easily do. Does anybody know what a Dremel is outside of a database? What is this hand gesture? Yeah, it's a tool, right? So there's a footnote in the paper. It's a brand of power tools, primarily used for speed to post a torque, right? It's more or less, this is the, the miniature version. It's just like a rotary like, drill, like a grinder you can use for things. Um, I'm always surprised that like, their lawyers let them put out like, a paper that says, hey, we have, this, we have this internal service for our multi-billion dollar company. Uh, and we've named it after another company, right? That's asking for a lawsuit, but they did it. And again, again but then the commercial version, they, they, they uh, cor you know, smartly renamed it as BigQuery. So all the documentation you'll see online for what Dremel's actually doing, uh, you know, it'll just be called BigQuery. But for whatever reason, the papers are still referred to it as Dremel. All right, so this no notion of in-situ data processing, we've already covered this many times throughout the semester. It just means that I have a bunch of files that are sitting out in some storage that's separate or uh, not under the control of the database system. And something else is going to be putting files there, and people then want to run queries on top of them. So obviously, I need to be able to have a way to know what the files are in some kind of catalog, right? and reference it to you know, some table or some logical identifier. Say, if you want to read this collection of data, or table foo, whatever you want to call it, here's the files where to go get it. Um, but other than that, the, the, the database system doesn't necessarily need to know anything. Now, when we read Snowflake next week, Snowflake uh, had what we call managed storage, where you ingest data into the database system. And then Snowflake is responsible for deciding how to chop it up and where to store it, and understands everything about it. In the newer versions of Snowflake, now they have to support you know, this lake house architecture. So they now support reading data from, from ice, iceberg files. Uh, same thing with, with Redshift. They originally started off being a shared nothing system. Everything was all managed storage. Now, you, with Athena, you can read files on S3. Yes? The Snowflake, they also charge like, the ETL cost between moving that data into the proprietary format? Uh, this question is, does Snowflake charge the ETL cost from getting data from, like, from, sorry, from, from remote storage into proprietary storage? Yeah. I'm sure they do, right? Like, doesn't, that, doesn't that make them a much worse product? Because if they have like, extra steps that they have to do? All right, let's, his question is, does it make it a much worse product because extra steps they have to do? Um, well, let's pause for that now for now, right? Um, Again, it's not always like cost matters, but performance matters. Like, there's so many different factors to say, like, is it a bad product? I don't, I don't want right, right, to, I'm not trying to be a cop out to like, you know, suck up to the you know, corporate masters or whatever. I'm just saying like, <laughs> depending on different, different you know, scenarios, that may or may not be a good idea. Okay. But the fact that they do support it now is a good thing, right? Um, and as we've seen throughout the semester, like, all these systems, are, when they, you, you have a bunch of files in some format, you know, we've seen this in the, the, the teams working on the, the caching server, the I.O. service here. You're going to convert it into Arrow or some other internal format and then process it anyway, right? So, you know, who pays for that cost? I don't, it depends on, it depends on the, the, the pricing model. So, again, this is this Dremel, this idea of Dremel, what they were trying to do was, was you know, reading, reading files where they exist, right? This is what we mean by data lake or the lake house stuff. Again, this is just a marketing term, but Dremel was doing it long ago. And in the paper, they point out that one of the key reasons that they went with this, uh, you know, trying to support this capability of just reading files where they exist is that it was better to have the, uh, that their, their, their users were willing to sacrifice performance of having like native, natively uh, managed data. Um, they would rather sacrifice that performance in terms of the, the flexibility or the ease of use. Meaning like I don't have to, you know, define a schema then load the files into my schema, then run queries on it, right? Because that there's a human cost to that, you know, labor cost. It's rather just yeah, my queries are going to run a bit slower because I'm I'm reading a bunch of files that maybe not be in the best format for my database system, but that's okay because I can just get to it really quickly. And from my perspective, yes, I, I think this is the right trade-off. And then SQL is typically the right abstraction you would want to do this. So for all the systems that we're going to we're going to look at uh, for the next two weeks. We're going to do sort of the same kind of summary page like this. We're going to hit all the high-level uh, 
aspects of the system as it relates to all the things we talked about throughout the semester. So again, a lot of this is going to be table stakes. It's just things that you would expect a modern lake house or OLAP engine to be able to support. So shared disk, disk aggregate storage, that's to be expected. Vectorized query processing, as we said, the papers, these papers aren't going to say anything deep about it. Uh, other than I know that BigQuery is using intrinsics, because we asked them. The paper doesn't say that, though. Uh, the shuffle-based distributed execution, we'll get in a second. Uh, well, th Google's going to have their own proprietary format called Capacitor. And we'll see that in a second, although there's not a lot, of, a lot of details about it. But it's basically going to look like Parquet and Orc, and I'm sure people are generating Parquet and Orc files uh, internally at, at Google. But for this column of storage, they're going to use all the tricks we talked about, so zone maps, filters, dictionary, and RLE compression. Uh, the only index they support in, um, in BigQuery, the service, is uh, inverted search indexes. Right, to do like you know like and, and regular expression lookups on on strings, they're only going to support hash joins, and then they use a combination of a heuristic optimizer and and a um, and a call and a very light cost based optimizer when you have some statistics, but usually they don't, and they're going to rely heavily on the ability to opti to adapt the query plan while it's running based on the data it sees. So. We're going to spend most of our time talking about this, because this is going to allow us to do things that we couldn't easily before. And this also is the transition to what we've been talking about in the entire semester, where we were talking about how do we build the single node execution engine first, and then now, now start glue it together. And these systems, especially with the shovel, is one way to start gluing it together. All right, so when a query shows up, the data system is going to convert it into uh, to a logical plant, and then, and then divide that into to stages roughly correspond to pipelines, but not always, not always necessarily. Um, and then within these stages, you're going to have multiple parallel tasks that I'm going to distribute it across the workers. And one key aspect of their, uh, of their query plans is that they need to guarantee that every task you would execute is going to be uh, deterministic, meaning if I execute it uh, over and over again with the same data, I should produce the exact same result. Uh, and it's going to be idempotent. And this is going to allow them to uh, have the ability to restart or kill a, a straggler or a task that's running slow, and then re-execute on another the task on another worker and be guaranteed to produce the same results. So think of things like if I have a random uh, call the random function in my query, I need to guarantee that no matter what what ta what worker I run on, when I invoke that random function, I, I get the same you know sequence of values or times another one too. The yes. Yes, yeah, so, so yes, deterministic in terms of how it's run and also producing the same result. So that, that's item potent. Yeah, yes. All right, so there'll be a root node or the coordinator that's going to be responsible for dispatching all the, the tasks. Uh, they talk about having a centralized scheduler, but the coordinator is, really, is, is sort of setting things up and then handing things off to the scheduler. And what's interesting, they talk about, and we'll see this, I think, also in the Snowflake paper as well, is that if you have all the workers going out to the catalog, the metadata server, and say, what, where's the files that I need what, you know, for, you know, when they start executing the task, then you could have thousands of workers all of a sudden flooding the, the, the catalog with, with it, it, uh, all these requests. So instead, the root, the root node is going to do a batch request to, the, to the, the catalog to get all the metadata about the files it's going to scan ahead of time, and then embeds that in a logical plan. So now when you hand the task off to the workers, they don't have to do a lookup in the catalog. They have everything they need to know uh, of how to process at the beginning. Every worker at the node is going to have its own local memory and local disk. And then if they run out of memory while they're processing the, the, that given task, they'll be able to spill to that disk and, and spool it back in as needed. But then also we'll see in a second, they're going to write out the results to uh, a remote memory service. So this is like a, a really simple query plan just doing a, uh, a, a lookup to to get the number of, of articles in Wikipedia with my name in it, or, or Pablo. There's some other asshole uh, Greek singer named Pablo, too, and he might be in there. Um, I used to be, when I was younger, like you just you Google Pablo, I would come up first. Now this other guy is, but whatever. All right, so we have a distributed file system, a bunch of data we want to access. Uh, the, the, in the first stage, the coordinator says, OK, I, I'm going to fire up a bunch of these workers. Uh, this is what I'm doing on partial group by. And then these workers are responsible for, for pulling the data that they need from the from the, the shared disk uh, storage, and then doing better processing on it. And then now the output of these workers are not going to go to the next stage of workers. Instead, they're going to go to this in-memory shuffle service. 
So all of the worker nodes are going to be writing out their data to this. Think of this like an in-memory key value store that's that's uh, that's you know partitioned or, or scaled out horizontally. So I can hash whatever the data I'm looking at and decide what what uh, you know send it send it to what shuffle node I need. And then now the shuffle node can then send additional metadata about here's the data I saw for this first stage for this query to the coordinator, and the coordinator can decide on the fly how many workers that it should use for the next stage. And then it spins up, you know, it submits that request to the, the scheduler. The scheduler then fires up these workers. Um, and then these guys are going to pull data from the in-memory shuffle. So they're not going to communicate from one worker to the next in, across the stages. They're always going to use this in-memory shuffle as an intermediary. Yes? Two questions. Yes. Hey, is the in-memory shuffle a single node thing, or is it like spread across? This question is: Is it, in, is it single node or, or, or scaled out? Scales out. Scales scaled out. out. Second thing: Why have that? Why not just make them like MapReduce does it, which is that you can it talk, like the workers talk to each other. Why? Do these questions. These questions. Why? Why am I doing this? Like, ha, why have this extra step to go to this piece versus having to, to have the worker just pull the data from the worker yeah. itself? Right. There's, there's performance implications of like if. If now, well, first of all, if, if I can kill all of these guys and then reusing the task for other things, and this thing is just maintaining the server, you know, maintaining the data, and then you know, otherwise I got to keep this thing around so that I make sure they get all the data that they need. Because what happens if, like, say one of these guys down, go down, then I got to go back to the, the previous worker and get the data again. And then, as I said, we'll see in a second, this this having this intermediate step that lend like get all the data I need. Uh, from this first stage, then I can decide what to do in the next stage because I've seen the data because I now have it in a sort of centralized location that I can pass along to the coordinator. Does it live for longer than uh, just one cycle? Like, do you keep that memory for a very long time? Uh, the question is, does, does, do I keep this memory around for a very long time? Uh, what you mean, like, what's the contents of the memory or the service itself? Uh, the service is always running. Right, but I mean the context of the memory in the sense that so we're waiting for all of those three workers to finish, right? Before, so that we can then erase that in-memory shuffle that we have over there. Yeah, so to get to when you get to the next stage. Yes. At what, at what point does this get blown away? Yeah. The core day would come back and say, "All right, I've I've completed this stage. Everybody's got the data. We still need to get past this stage, okay. right? Because again, these guys could crash, and you need to go fetch it again. Right. But once you know that nobody else is going to go back to the data you need, you can you can blow it away. Another thing. That needs to be like a shit ton of memory, and also, yes, uh, like that. Like the worker can die, but this can die too, right? Like, yeah. So, but it's it's just a key value store. There's no techniques to to replicate this and scale this out, right? It's even crazier. They actually fab custom hardware to make this go as fast as possible. Oh. Okay. Yeah. It's awesome. Yes. Uh, the question is, why not keep track of metadata rather than stream all the data here? But where do you keep the data? Here, right? That means these guys can't go away until the, you've gotten the data over there. So, so in MapReduce, the idea was that the intermediate data gets flushed to disk because that intermediate result might be too big in size. Yep. So here you're assuming that the memory is, like, is big enough to store all of that. And then isn't that what uh, Spark also like? So he said two things. One is in Hadoop, you would write to local disk here because you might spell, you might run on memory. Um, whereas in this case here, can like it's just so massive that you're not going to run out of memory. This thing can spill to disk too. We'll see it in a second, right? And actually, it'll spill to GFS or, or Colossus, whatever the, the Google file system. Um, and then your second comment is, isn't it, isn't what Spark is doing? Spark Spark still I think main, still maintains the. Uh, the shuffle data on the worker nodes. Yeah, it actually does the, uh, the same thing the map produces. The in memory thing happens after stage two, basically. Because map app produce happens, then memory happens. The other seems to be happening between map produce, which is interesting. I would say also, this is not a, this is not like uh, Dremel or even map produce Hadoop didn't invent this idea of this like shuffle step. That's distributed databases, parallel databases from the 80s and 90s, right? Um, what's unique about BigQuery and Dremel is that they explicitly do this between every stage, right? Snowflake that has a shuffle, has, can do shuffles as well, but they only use it as needed. Uh, they do this for everything. Yes? Are there disadvantages to always doing it? Like, what if you want the data on the same 
his question is, are there disadvantages of doing this? Uh, what if you always want data on the, on the same worker? Ah, OK. So this is what I was saying before. I think I said back here, the, the call it stages, they're not always pipeline breakers, though. In some cases, you can have the, the second stage kick off while this stage is still running, right? And you can you know, start processing it ahead of time. Right? So, so that's one advantage there, that, that you could start doing this. Uh, you could have this thing get fired up and start reading the data before these guys even finish. Right? From a software engineering standpoint also, too, that now you no longer have to in, 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 embed logic of how to like scale up or scale down or do other optimizations we'll see in a second at, at all your workers. Because now it's just, like, it's just a coordinator that says, OK, I need more workers. Do it this way. Or move the data this, here and there. And from a software engineering perspective, like the worker implementations is much more simple now. All right. So again, at the end, we, we, the last stage we're doing a certain limit. One worker can, can handle that. And as far as I know, these are just like containers uh, and running in Borg, which is the, the precursor to, to Kubernetes. Right. So they're meant to be stateless. Uh, so these things can get, can get killed and swapped out at any time. Wait, is that why they're doing the memory shuffle? Because they're supposed to be stateless and they don't want to keep them alive, something stateless alive? It's, I mean, the question is, like, is, is that why you're doing memory shuffle? Because these things are stateless and you don't want to keep them alive? Potentially. I mean, it's, it's one, one, one of the ideas, yes. But again, be, there's, there's, there's database query plan advantages that, that we, can, we can leverage if we have this extra st stage. We'll see in a second. Oh. So the, the shuffle is basically a producer-consumer producer model. It's just a way to send the intermediate results from one stage to the next, uh, using, again, using this dedicated service. And as I'm saying, this in the paper talks about like this MRE service is used not just for, um, uh, for, for Dremel. I think Dremel is, is the, main, uh, the main consumer of, of, of this service. It's used in other services within in Google as well. Um, all right, so again, the workers just send their output to the shuffle nodes, and then if the, if the shuffle nodes can run out of space, they can spill to GFS if necessary. Um, and then the it's just like a you know, get and set API. So then the, the workers in the next stage is say get, 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 and, and get more data from, from the shuffle nodes. Right, so in this case here, say that the, all the workers are, are consuming data from the previous stage. In this case here, it could be from the, from the distributed file system, the data I'm reading, or it could be from the shuffle service itself. And then they're processing the data, and they're you know they're doing n-way traffic on the outside going out. Uh, and if I run out of memory, I can always spill to to the distributed file system. And then another key advantage of why you want to do this is that I no longer have to do sort of the the end-to-end -end communication or end-to-end -end communication between one stage to the next, right? Because this data is going to be going to be par partitioned. That I only need to send or get the data from a subset of the workers rather than, than sending it to all the possible workers, right? So without the shuffle service, without having to know exactly you know, what, because the coordinator is going to tell us, here's the data you need, here's the shuffle nodes, go get it from. Without that, potentially have to pull all these guys and say, do you have any data that I could be consuming? So from that perspective, this, this is way more efficient in terms of uh, communication traffic. And then I, I think also, too, they can pull from the, the Jupyter file system rather than having to go and get it from the, the shuffle service if, if anything gets filled to disk. So again, the shuffle is basically just like a checkpoint in the query, query plan. And so this part is actually unique to, to Dremel because historically, parallel distributed databases didn't do checkpoints. and They weren't fault tolerant within the query itself, meaning like if I had a two-hour query that was going to run and one node happens to die partway through, then the whole query dies and I got to restart. Because from the, from the database system's perspective, the, the disk was so slow that it was, uh, it, was, it was just not worth it to, do, to write out intermediate results. Right? Whereas Hadoop, as he, as he mentioned, is doing that for between every shuffle, was always writing things out the local disk or, and then replicating out things on, uh, on HGFS. And that was really slow, because, but that was Google's model of like, OK, we're running on cheap pizza box machines, that could, you know, thousands of machines that could die any time. Whereas the, in a, from a parallel database system perspective, it was better to design the system, assuming you're running on you know, not $1,000 rack machines, but like high-end machines that aren't going to crash that often. And, that you, cause you'll, and so you get better performance 
but not, you're not fault tolerant to uh, if one of those nodes go down. So the in-memory service allows them to give that fault tolerance by taking a checkpoint between the different stages of the query plan. But because it's an in-memory service, it's in-memory, it's not going to be as slow as writing to disk. Now with NVMe drives, maybe, you know, maybe it's less, less of an issue because disk got really, really fast. But you know, 10 years ago, that, you know, this obviously was a big concern. So you get fault tolerance because any time a, 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 a node crashes, you, know, you just get the data that, that you need uh, from the in-memory shuffle and run the task on another service because it's idempotent. You can run it again without any side effects. Um, if a, if a you know, task is running too slow, because the worker node is, for whatever reason, slow. The big query guys told me that one of the big problems they faced is sometimes they'll land on to run a query on a node that where another container is like doing encoding for, for YouTube. Uh, and they can look at the traffic and actually know it was YouTube, and that slow down the query. So if you have a straggler, then you can go ahead and just kill it and assign the task to another worker that can run faster. And then also, too, as I sort of alluded to, it's going to allow, because we have this explicit stage, it's like, OK, we can, we can take, a, take a step back. Look at what our query has done so far. Look what the data looks like. And then decide at the next stage, do we need to scale up or scale down the number of workers we need to process the query? So look, look both those examples here. So the workers are running. They're, they're producing data that they're sending to the shuffle nodes. Um, and say, for whatever reason, this node is just falling behind. It can't keep up. So uh, if we can decide to go ahead and kill it and just reassign the, the, the task to this other worker here. So again, it's just getting the data either from the, the, from the distributed file system, it'll be there, or from the shuffle service, which again, will always be there. And then once I have collected all my data in my, in my, in my storage, uh, sorry, in the, in the shuffle storage, I post some information to the coordinator who can look at the statistics of what the data actually looks like, and then decide, based on what the, the, the SLA requirements are for the, for the, the query, you know, do I have too many workers or none, not enough workers? Uh, and then I can, you know, if I want to, I can regenerate, add more. And then I don't have to move any of this data around. I just reassign what worker is going to read what data from the shuffle service. Yes? I just want to clarify what you mean by checkpoint. So I think you said that the shuffle service only is still if there's not enough. So checkpoint meaning, yeah, it's very clear. Yes. So it's not a checkpoint in that we think about in like the intro Davis class where I'm taking all the contents of memory and I'm writing at the disk. I think it's like it's it's a I don't want to use the word staging point because these are already called stages, but it's like a it's a pause is also not the right word because it's not like you're stopping anything, but it's a what's another word for a checkpoint? Save point. It's kind of like replicating. Save point is actually very something explicit either. Sorry, say it again. It's kind of like you're replicating data. It's still in memory, but it's in the. It's it's more from a, from a logistical standpoint that like I I can before I start executing the next stage. I can decide, do I need to re change my query plan or change my topology of, of, of the query plan or the, the, the number of workers I have in the, in the subsequent stages? Because I've seen the data that got, got generated from the previous stage. Okay. Yeah, so, so checkpoint, I don't mean that like everything in here always gets written to disk, because they want to keep things in memory as possible. Because for in intermediate results, who cares about, like, I don't need the data beyond the query I'm actually trying to run right now. There are some papers about how we use data structures from one point to the next, sort of like a mini materialized view. Like if I hash table for, if I build a hash table for a join, can I keep that hash table around from one query to the next? They're not doing that. Literally, it's just like, I get all my data in this location. I can then have a global view of what's going on and decide where to go next or what to do next. Yes? Are different like, shuffle nodes stored in different files? This question is, are different shuffle nodes stored where? Sorry? Uh, I mean, the, the, this is just in memory. Think of an in memory hash table. So, like, you have two, right? Yes. Are they, like, stored in different data? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, it's is like, are these, yes. So, think of this as, like, um, like I, I produce some work, I, I, I pro my task processes some data, and then I have a, a, a key on the, on the data I hash, and I mod it by the number of. of oh, so like, by hash Yeah. It's just like a, think of like a, a, a consistent hash table. Yes. Is this distributed file system like does this also exist on the same worker nodes or is it completely separate? This is a completely separate service. Completely separate. This is like Colossus GFS. This is this is their S3. So, so I guess like from the perspective of the workers, they don't care if it's in memory or not. Right? 
I mean, you care about it in memory because you want to be able to hand it to the person as quickly as possible, whoever asked for it. That's the whole point of like these things. These are large memory machines. Uh, is S3 built on top of a file system? I this is, I mean, this is Google. It's not S3. But like you said, it was dead S3. That's what I was just curious. I've just, it, it's, it's, it's an object store, yeah, right? Um, I thought somebody to post, I think somebody said S3 is at least the metadata is built, built on MySQL. Um, but again, that's, for this, we don't, we don't care. OK. So I keep alluding to, OK, now that we have this, this, this staging area in, in the memory shuffle store, and we're collect, now we can collect statistics about what the, the data, the data we got, we, we've, we've gotten from the, from, the, from, the, from the previous stage, we can start making decisions about what we want to do. But in the very, very beginning, obviously, we don't have any of that information. Because right? we did some, a bunch of files we may, may not ever scan before. I think the paper even said it, says like a large percentage of the, of the data uh, that the Dremel queries are processing are, are files that the data system has never seen before. Right? So, so there's no statistics. So how can we actually try to generate an optimal query plan without any of this? They also talk about the ability to do, do queries against other data sources or data, database systems. Um, and this is oftentimes called, called connectors. And we'll see this in other systems as, as we go along. But like, the idea is that I have a single logical view within BigQuery Dremel to a bunch of different disparate database systems. And now when I run my query, I can say, like, go read this Postgres table. And then the, the system is responsible for then writing the, the, the corresponding query to go against Postgres and get the data that it, that it needs. But at that point, if we're running a query on another, uh, you know, our query gets generated to it gets converted to another query that runs on another system, we have no statistics. We have nothing, right? The worst case scenario, we'd, we'd be doing like a select star against some other table and then do processing with, once we get it into our, our system. Best case scenario, we can, we can do some kind of predicate push down to the other system. But again, at this point, again, you don't have any stats. So the way Dremel is a new query optimization is a stratified approach with a rule-based optimizer and a cost-based optimizer that only uh, that only does basic analysis of the cost based one only does basic analysis on the on the on the data or on the data trying to access if you have actually some some information already about it. So for the rules, it's all the classic stuff we talked about: doing predicate push down, primary key, foreign key hints, uh, some very basic join ordering. Um, they have custom rules to do uh, uh, do constraint propagation for start schemas. Like, uh, you could propagate the, maybe the constraints from a dimension table into a fact table. Um, or like if you're doing, uh, if, if, you know, if, it's a, again, if, if the system will detect it, if you have a star schema, so a fact table with all the dimension tables, then when it generates the, the, the stages, it knows to always generate the hash tables, build the hash tables on the dimension tables, and then have this single pipeline where you write up the fact table all the way up and just do probes and all these hash tables. Right. So they have basic rules to check these things, but then they only trigger the, the cost-based analysis and optimizations if you have some stats, which they only generate uh, if, if you have a materialized view. But most of the queries are not, you know, materialized views are not the common case. They have to deal with not having any statistics. So instead, to avoid any kind of bad cost model estimates that we saw before, they're going to apply adaptive query optimization techniques, and they're going to do this relying on that shuffle stage as a way to say, OK, stop, let's look at what's going on, and then recalibrate as, as needed. So we'll see various other techniques that are used uh, to do that adaptive query optimization in Snowflake and Databricks and, other, and so forth. Um, they're not going to be as aggressive or, sort of, or all-encompassing as the some papers that we discussed. They're not doing plan stitching, but they're also not in, in, in embedding those so sort of trigger plan nodes to decide to go to this query plan versus the other. They're going to be more like change the 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 number of workers that may have, or, and maybe change the um, what join algorithm they want to use based on the data that I've seen, but not like to recalibrate, reorganize the entire query plan. So when uh, we can do this because we have the the, the, the shuffle staging point. Uh, where we can look at the data we've collected, and the idea is that you want to fix things as we go along. So obviously, we've already seen how to change the number of workers in a stage. Like if I recognize that the data is showing up, 
is much larger or smaller than I anticipated, because maybe there's a very selective a filter that I didn't anticipate was gonna throw away most of the data, then I can scale down the, the number of workers that I have at the next stage. Uh, you can decide whether you wanna do a shuffle or a broadcast join based on the data that shows up in the, sh in the shuffle phase. We'll see that in a second. I also can change, um, they have talked about how you can change what, what the implementation of the operator you're gonna use. This one I don't fully understand what, because they don't talk about it in the paper, but like, they have notions of like I have a um, I could have an operate implementation for small partitions or large partitions. I'm guessing things like unrolling loops and things like that. If you know you're only going to read a small number of data in each partition, and then dynamic repartitioning is a way to uh, to maybe split data up more if you have a hot bucket uh, again based on the data you've seen. So I'll go through I'll, I'll go through these two examples. All right, so say I have a query here that's going to read. T data from table A and table B, and I want to do a join. So on the very first stage, I'm going to have a bunch of workers read data from table A and a bunch of workers read from, B, from data from table B. And again, maybe there's some filter I push down in these workers. They're going to start uh, printing data. And then the, these workers will start submitting all the results from these scans into the, the shuffle stage. And if you think of like internally, we'll just build a, you know, a histogram or a counter that says how much data we, we put into for the partitions at, at these two tables. And say, for whatever reason, table A is, is much smaller than we anticipated. So in that case here, we, maybe we don't want to actually do the shuffle join. We're just we're repartitioning the, the data on the join key. We could recognize that this data is actually small, small enough to fit on every single node, and we can change what join we want to use. So again, say the original idea was that uh, we were going to do a, a, we're going to hash the data and then send it to individual workers. They're, more, they're pulling from this, but I'm showing the arrow of like, here's the data flow. But again, if this thing is super small, then I can just change it to a broadcast join, where now the, the, the workers will, every worker will go get the entire contents of table A from uh, the shuffle service. And then I still do the, sh the shuffle on B, to partition it up, but now when I, when I join B with A, I, I have all the data I need to do the join locally. The other choice is to do uh, dynamic partitioning. So say that I have, uh, I'm scanning my data, right? And say again, for whatever reason, partition one is much smaller than I anticipated. Sorry, partition two is much larger than I anticipated. So this thing's gonna spill to disk and that's gonna be slow. So what I can do is, uh, you know, as, as I'm running, I'm passing statistics to the coordinator and then I can say, okay, let me create two new partitions. That's my biological daughter. <laughs> All right, sorry. Uh, so, so the coordinator says, okay, well, this partition is going to run out of space. So now go send a message to the worker and say, all right, anything you're going to partition to, to you're going to send to partition to, hash it again and send it to uh, these two new partitions I just added. It's basically recursive partitioning from the Grace hash join algorithm we saw in the intro class, right? So then these guys start, you know, keep running and they start filling up data from these two, these two partitions. And then when this, this stage is done, I introduce a new task in my stage to do repartition that then goes from trees data. Sorry, this is not professional. I, I, I go read, I go read the data from partition two uh, and then it just rehashes it and puts it in, in partition three and four, All right? Uh, in the previous one for the two joins, yes. uh, the sh one of them always needs to be a broadcast, right? It's just a, which one you want to make the broadcast. Yeah, one doesn't always have to be a broadcast. So, yeah, it's you can do the shuffle join. So shuffle join is just like everything. Everything gets repartitioned on the hash key, right? right? Uh, the alternative is just do just do a broadcast join, where one of them gets broadcast to everybody, and then you, and then you don't have to do, you just scan locally. And actually, yeah. So on the stage I'm missing, if you do a broadcast join, you don't like I do broadcast A, then I don't need to do partitioning on B. So you go ahead and kill these workers here. And then in the next stage, they're just going to read the data from directly from the table, the files. Yes, yeah, so I'm missing arrows to draw that. that, that yeah, that, that's how you do a broadcast join. Because the idea is like one small enough you can send around everywhere, and you leave the other table uh, where, where, where it originally resided. Okay. So as I said before, they're, they were going to rely on the, an internal distributed file system called, uh, called Colossus. 
Originally, we started off with GFS, but then they switched to Colossus to, to do scale storage. Again, just think of it like it's like an object store, like S3 and other ones we've talked about. And the idea is that this is, this is an external service to the database system. You just let, let them manage all the storage for us. So the paper also talks about how they're going to rely on um, a, a file format called Capacitor, which is internal to Google. This link here will take you to a blog article that, that mentions it. There isn't much documentation about it. It's not open source. Um, but it more or less looks like Orc and, and, and Parquet when you, when you talk to them, the, the, the Google people. right? Um, one thing that Capacitor does do that Orc and Parquet do not do is that you can do predicate pushdown and, and partial query evaluation or, or expression evaluation within the access library itself directly on, on the data. So in S3, again, you can do some pushdown of some where clauses on select for select statements on the Parquet files and, or, or Parquet and, and CSV files or JSON files as well. But it's, it's pretty limited. And certainly in the case of, um, like, you know, if you just access Parquet through, through the arrow files, like you ha it decompresses everything as you're iterating of, of the data, whereas this thing can do uh, filtering directly on compressed data without decompressing it first. There's another file format called Artist that was for the YouTube Priscilla system that has similar cap capabilities. But at a high level, this is just, this is just going to look like Parquet and Org, except that you can do better, better, better earlier filtering. And we saw before how they're going to handle repetition definition fields to, to deal with uh, nested data, like think JSON data, but again, it's Google world, so it's protocol buffers. These file formats, uh, capacitor, are going to be self-describing, meaning, again, just like Parquet and Orc, there'll be something in the footer that says, here's the schema that you, spe you expect to see. Um, and then they talk about how the data, the, the, the metadata for the, the, in the schema is just stored as columnar data as well. So even though I may have 10,000 attributes in my, uh, in my file, I don't have to deserialize the entire thing like, like you would have to do in par Parquet and Orc. I can just do the... the, the you know, do all the optimizations we have to look up and clone our data directly on the metadata to find the things that I'm looking for. Again, this is not, uh, this itself is not like mind blowingly uh, amazing, but it's certainly better than what's in Parquet and what's better than, than, than in Orc in the current state of the art. All right, the last interesting thing to talk about in this paper uh, is similar to what we saw in the Velox paper, where they talked about how. You know, Dremel was the, I mean, the, one of the big first systems that, they, that Google built that, that brought back SQL. And then once SQL became in fashion again at Google, uh, there's a bunch of these different random projects that people started adding their own you know, for, for SQL. But the problem is all of these different internal projects had their own dialect of, of SQL. And so there was an effort in the, the late 2010s to, to, to unify this across the entire corporation by having a single SQL dialect called Google SQL that, that all these systems would then incorporate. So that way you didn't have to deal with the weird uh, nuances of one SQL dialect to the another. Across the entire corporation, everything was always the same. Um, so the, this, again, in the Velox world, they talked about how like, there was all these like, substring functions, and everyone was re-implementing the wheel over and over again, but Velox was meant to standardize those implementations. The same idea here. So, Google SQL itself is not open source, but there's an open source variant of it called Zeta SQL. Who here has ever heard of Zeta SQL? Nobody. Okay. So this thing here is supposed to be the open source version of this, and the idea was like, okay, yeah, here's you know people could start building, uh, you know, Zeta SQL compatible uh, database systems that would then smell a lot like Google SQL. So like if you're comfortable with like running on you know whatever this one-off system based on Zeta SQL. You know, you can easily transition your your you know your your application over to 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 BigQuery or Dremel or other or Spanner as well. So this thing is basically, as far as I can tell, is dead. Like there was like there's new updates. There's some an update like a month ago on GitHub, but like it says at the bottom, it's not officially supported by Google. There's a bunch of pull requests and issues that aren't being responded to or answered, right? So as far as I can tell, th this thing is dead. Like, and there's only one database system I know that actually supports that as SQL. It's called Apache Beam. It's like a stream processing system, but nobody else is actually using this. Um, and which, to me, this is interesting because, again, Google was, or I mean, Google still is huge, right? Google still is very influential in, in the tech community, but.
But if they're putting out a Siegel dialect that say this is what the, the, you know, the standard should be, and no one follows it, like you know, this shows you like that the Siegel marketplace is so diverse and fractured that like no one company, even a major tech giant, can can sort of bend the you know the bend the you know, the physics or bend the world to, to you know to, to their to their whims. The last time this was actually done was IBM, right? IBM came out in 82, 83 and said, okay, we're putting out a new database system and it's gonna be based on SQL, SQL's the standard. And everyone sort of got in line and followed along and SQL became what it is today. Uh, but now things are so diverse that I, I don't think you could ever do that again. The closest you can get to is, a, I think, a, a true, I mean, there's the SQL standard, the ISO SQL standard, but as I said, nobody actually follows that. The closest you can get to a dialect that everyone is based on is Postgres. Because everyone takes the Postgres parser or the grammar file and reuses it. Like DuckDB did, did this, a bunch of other systems did this. And Google, you know, uh, I'm not saying they, they tried and failed, but like, uh, you know, no, like no one's going to use that as SQL. Okay. So, there's, again, since the 2011 paper, uh, as I mentioned, there's a bunch of systems that have come out that are. In some cases, like wholesale, they even claim it's, it's a copy off of the architecture, but other ones are more likely to say that it's inspired. Um, so I want to go through these four here. And then what's also interesting about this is that there, in the last three or four years, uh, there are now separate shuffle as a service components or architectures or systems that you, you could then use that maybe don't exactly replicate all the capabilities of the, the, the Dremels in, in memory shuffle service, certainly not using hardware acceleration, but now that, again, there's sort of separate projects that do nothing but shuffles, uh, which I think is kind of cool. And so we'll, we'll talk about the Celeborn one from Alibaba, because that one's, that one's the farthest along, Uniful and, and the, the Uber one. I mean, I'm sure they're still using this. Uniful is still, um, and again, Apache incubator project, so so early. But this, as far as I know, this, this is the big one. So again, let me go through each of these systems, and I'll, and I'll cover this one, and then we'll finish up and go out for the, uh, for the Eclipse. All right, Apache Drill is, again, this one claimed to be a straight-up copy. Like, Dremel is a drill, Apache Drill, right? No imagination there. <laughs> so this started as a, uh, right after the Dremel paper came out, uh, as a way to build up a, a, a query engine on top of, uh, of HDFS. And this was started at, a, at a, a tech company called MapR. This was in the, in the late 2000, early 2010, there was three major Hadoop companies or MapReduce companies. There was uh, Cloudera, Hortonworks, and MapR. Cloudera and Hortonworks are based on the op open source version, Hadoop, the Java one. MapR had their own proprietary C++ version that was meant to be faster. And so MapR built a, uh, you know, built, built, started building Apache uh, Drill. But actually, this was in, is in Java. And so what's interesting about this is that they are going to do uh, cogen uh, query compilation using this thing called Janino, which is basically it's some kind of um, embedded Java compiler where you can give it Java code and it converts it uh, in process. So this project is not dead, but certainly the, the number of commits and, and engagement and usage of it has, has gone down. Um, MapReduce, or sorry, MapR uh, was on the market a couple times, finally got acquired for, for not much by HPE, and the HPE announced in, um, in 2020 that they're basically stopping all development on this. At least their HPE is not paying for the developers to work on this, but other people are, st are still, still working on it. Um, so I would say that this is not, you know, th there's better alternatives now, uh, especially in the open source world. But, it, you know, this was the first one that sort of came out directly after the Dremel paper came out. Did it do the shuffle in the in-memory shuffle thing? I think this one did the in-memory shuffle, yes. Again, with not, with not the hardware. The next one is Presto DB. Uh, this was started at Facebook. I, I wouldn't say this is like directly inspired by Dremel because I think they were working on this. Um, they were already working on this when when the Dremel paper came out. But they were building. Facebook was building this to replace Hive, which was a um, which is a way to do SQL on top of MapReduce. It would take your SQL query and then convert it literally into MapReduce Java jobs and then just in, in, and run those. And obviously that would be super slow because MapReduce was slow. Um, but the idea, again, same, same motivation that they have a bunch of files stored in data lakes, in this case, it's HTFS, or I think Facebook has their own internal distributed file system. Um, and they had a way to do a bunch of connectors, different storage systems, data systems, similar to Dremel. 
Um, and a few years ago, Facebook announced that they're getting off of the Java-based runtime engine, and they're switching everything, everything to Velox. Like the Velox paper talks about this project called Prestissimo. Prestissimo. This is one of the, 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 the targets they, they were building Velox for, to replace the Java engine with the C++ engine in, in Velox. There's also another version of Presto called Trino, previously called Presto SQL. So the, the first version of the project was called Presto. Then it was called Presto DB. And then there was a fork called Presto SQL. Uh, then it got renamed to Trino. And this was done by the Starburst guys that came out of, um, uh, out of uh, Teradata. No, they, they, by Astrodata. Ast they acquired by Astrodata, and Astrodata acquired. Ast so there was a project called Hadoop DB. There was a company called Hadapt. Uh, Hadapt got acquired by Astrodata, and then Astrodata got acquired by Teradata. And then Teradata spun out this as Starburst. There we go. Um, anyway, so they didn't like how Facebook wouldn't give up the control of the source code. Like Hive came out of Facebook, and that's Apache project. For whatever reason, Presto was still not Apache project, and it wasn't. Uh, Facebook wasn't giving up control. So these guys forked it, renamed it as Trino. And I think this went to the, the Cloud Computing Foundation. And then Facebook then converted, gave up source control and gave PrestoDB to the Linux Computing Foundation. Right? So not Apache, but these, these other similar kind of foundations. So what's interesting about this is in Presto or PrestoDB, Facebook is again trying to get rid of the Java stuff in place of Velox. The Trino guys, they're very explicit with saying they don't want to give up Java. Right, they have a, a blog article or a, they had a pod, podcast uh, a year or two ago, and they talk about here explicitly that like, they rather spend the time trying to make the, the query, plan, query optimizer better uh, than, than try to spend a bunch of engineering effort to replace the, the execution engine with something like Velox or even Data Fusion. All right. So is, wait, is Hive the query engine, or is that the? Hive is the query engine. The same way the is a query engine, Presto is a query engine, Trino is a query engine. The question is, why, how is Presto and Hive connected? Face, Facebook first built Hive because right. they were like, OK, they had all this, all this MapReduce stuff, infrastructure. MapReduce is slow. And people are writing Java code for running queries instead of SQL. So then they built Hive, which is a front end uh, query engine that can take your SQL query and convert it into a MapReduce job and run that. That's slow because MapReduce is slow, and the, the Hadoop model is slow. So then they said, OK, let's get rid of that, and let's have build uh, keep HDFS or the shared file system, and let's build a query engine that takes SQL and can run the actual query plans directly as SQL. That's Presto, similar to Dremel. Okay. And that one also has the in-memory shuffle. Uh, actually, I, Presto, I don't know. I should look that up. I, actually, I don't know. Good question. All right, another project again that that, that came it was definitely direct, definitely directly inspired by uh, Dremel. Uh, was a thing called Impala that came out of Cloudera. And so this, this was founded by people that Cloudera hired from Google who didn't work on Dremel but, but used it and, and were inspired by it. Um, but the, the, the key thing that they did, that they didn't, that an Impala did, I think it still works this way, that rather than have the, the, the query engine and the workers pull the data from the shared storage and then do the processing you know, on, on the worker nodes. Um, they want to, to do more predicate push down than you can do on, on S3 or, or you know, GFS at the time. So what they would do is that on the distributed file system, you'd actually install a little execution engine down there. And I think this is all written in Java. So this is like the JVM. So the worker could, could then do predicate push down uh, and, other, and other push downs. And that would run that part of the query directly where the data was being stored. So this was HDFS at the time. So then like on your HDFS node, you also install this Impala executor node, who then take the queries and, and process the data locally before sending it back. So that's not a true disaggregated storage, the way that we've been talking about the entire semester. But they did this because they wanted to be able to do the, the, the predicate pushdown. I think they also did query compilation, but they did they compiled it. Uh, I, they actually take back. This was not Java. This was in C++. And I think they were doing like uh, predicate compilation on like where clauses, and they would put, they could do that down there, and for like C, C, uh, CSV parsing and other things. We'll see we'll see more about Impala next class when we talk about Databricks, right? Because Cloudera was the big big MapReduce company, uh, and they were pushing Impala very heavily. But then everyone started asking for Spark, uh, 
So they also had to start supporting Spark, but then Spark's like, hey, let's add SQL. And Cloudera didn't like that because they wanted people to buy Impala. And then the Spark guys do this one trick, we'll see next class, of how they got SQL into Spark. I mean, basically, they embedded it instead of having it being a middleware. Uh, and it, 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 Databricks basically destroyed Cloudera. We'll come at, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss this more next class. All right, Dremio is probably the, uh, of all the open source ones we've talked about, uh, again, directly inspired by uh, Dremel. Um, and actually is backed by a you know, VC-backed company. Actually founded by a CMU alum. I think he did his master's here, but he wasn't my student, as far as I know. And as I said before, they're doing all the things that we talked about, uh, very similar to, to in Dremel. But one of the things that we're able to do to speed things up is to, rep, to, to access what are called, they call reflections. But as far as we can tell, they're just materialized views. Right? They're doing on, on Java-based CoGen, uh, I think for the entire query, not just aware clauses, and vectorization, as we talked about before. All right, and then the last one is Apache Celebron, Celeborn. Um, this, again, just shuffle as a service. Came out of Alibaba. Um, the idea is that in Spark and Flink, you can actually specify what shuffle service you want. Like there's a b default built in one where the worker nodes send the data directly to the other, you know, to the other worker nodes, but you can actually have, use this as a standalone service as an intermediary. And it can do all the things that we talked about so far, like I can spell the disk when, when I run out of memory. They can actually do block compression of the, of the, of the data when they put it down the disk. Um, and so forth. And again, it's just a key value store that's fault tolerant. And I think this one's using Raft internally. There's another one, the, um, the Uniful, that's based on Zookeeper, right? It's, it's just a key value store, that's, but it's only meant for you know, moving data back and forth between these different stages of queries. All right, so to finish up, Dremel is, is very, very influential, as I said, in the combination of vector wise for like the single node query processing, plus the uh, Dremel for like sort of overall architecture. Not everyone does the shuffle, as we'll see as we go along with. I think the combination of these two things gives you what, what, what we would call a, a modern lake house. And although the shuffle stuff seems wayful, wasteful, it is actually going to make things better because I, uh, I can keep as much memory as much as possible. I can disconnect the warm workers at one stage to the next. Right? There are a bunch of advantages to this. Not just performance, also from engineering, because it simplifies the implementation of all the workers. Um, and this is another good example too of, of, of sort of with the projects you guys are working on based on. It's like by decoupling the system architectures and, and having one group just spend as much time to optimize this one piece that then can be taken advantage of by other parts of the system. I think that's the right way to, to, to build a modern cloud native system today. Okay? All right. Again, next class, we'll talk about Spark, SQL, and, and Photon. This is going to be different than the Dremio paper, because the Dremio paper is an entire system. The, the Photon, you're going to see, it's going to look like Velox, right? It's going to be something you embed inside the JVM of, in, for the, the Spark runtime, rather than being its own standalone system, OK? All right, so that, let's stop now. And let's go outside and check out the Eclipse. Get a grip, take a sip, and you'll be picking up models. Ain't it no puzzle, I'll guzzle cause I'm more a man. I'm down in the 40 and my shorty's got four cans. Stacks and six packs on the table. And I'm able to see St. Isles on the label. No shorts with the cloth, you know I got them. I take off the cap, but first I tap on the bottom. Throw about three in the freezer so I can kill it. Careful with the bottle, baby, you just don't spill it. Cause St. Isles is said, the pain I sweat. You drink it down with the guys, it'll rise head. Take back the pack of duds. You go get you some St. Isles and drink it to the suds. Billy D is the silly cheese, so down with the weak guys. Be a man to get a can of St. Isles.